<clears throat> well, I told you today I was going to try to raise your spirits somewhat. Uh, a couple of conversations with students in my office leads me to, to uh, restate something I said at the beginning, but which I can easily understand you might have forgotten, especially since I chose a couple of poor examples. Throughout, I have intended to be talking about the testing of substantive causal theories. And if you were an industrial psychologist or a counselor or a clinician, uh, uh, you should not conclude that we are in such terrible shape uh, as regards technology. Now, we aren't in such great shape in that respect either, uh, but the point is that uh, uh, the use of significance tests, particularly when they are combined with some kind of overlap statistic, whatever is appropriate for the clinical uh, problem, uh, I am not attacking that when we're trying to validate a test for selecting um, people to go to dental school or uh, schizophrenics for shock therapy or uh, officers to go to uh, army command staff school or something of that sort. We, the things I've been saying are aimed at the weakness of the traditional significance test approach as a means of corroborating substantive uh, theories. Um, all right, some, some, some suggestions about uh, ways that we might uh, improve things a bit on the theory front. Um, first, uh, address to investigators. Uh, one should try to, in doing an experiment uh, involving correlational uh, interactions or in doing a straight correlational study, um, one should try to have uh, some rationale for the expected size of a correlation or a difference based upon one's theory. I don't maintain that that's always possible. I do say that we don't work at that quite as hard as we could or should. Um, at the very least, one should ask the following question. If I got a difference only of size so-and-so, to what extent would I view that as strongly corroborating my substantive theory? And if the answer is, well, <laughs> not very much. At least it's, it may be consistent with it, as we say, but uh, I really wouldn't get an awful lot of mileage uh, from a difference of such and such a size in the particular domain that we're working in. Secondly, I, uh, despite it being a two-edged sword, uh, I would uh, say that we should try to follow Cohen's advice. In fact, I would even boost it a little bit and say you should try to figure out from your pilot study <clears throat> how, how many degrees of freedom you need to get a power of 0.9 for the size of difference that you're concerned with, for a difference that you would consider, if you got it, would uh, uh, be a strong corroborator of your theory. Thirdly, um, as was pointed out by somebody in class last time, uh, if you uh, uh, take... Uh, 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 Campbell and Fisk's uh, classic paper seriously, uh, uh, you would uh, make an effort at least to put into your data matrix a few variables that you do not want to be highly correlated with whatever it is you're studying and such that they're good candidates to be nuisance covariance things and so that uh, you are putting your interpretation at risk by plugging into the design things that you do not want to be correlated. Um, if I, uh, if I uh, list, for instance, the kind of indicators that uh, 
should be used in testing my theory of schizophrenia, uh, had we got the grant, which we didn't, um, I would, uh, uh, I, I put as much emphasis, although I didn't convince Will Grove to stick it all in the grant, but uh, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, uh, I put as much emphasis on the things that indicators, if, uh, candidate indicators shouldn't discriminate as the uh, things that they should. If you want to test a neurological theory of schizophrenia, uh, uh, a theory of my type, um, uh, you want, uh, you do not want an indicator in there to be, for instance, a correlate of clinical status. You don't want it to discriminate the catatonics from the hebephrenics. You don't want it to discriminate the deteriorated schizes from the early blooming ones. Uh, you don't want it to discriminate those that have primarily the, the uh, uh, positive symptoms from those that have, uh, have almost nothing along those lines, but mainly the uh, so-called negative symptoms. And uh, that goes against what a lot of people do in researching this because they're interested in the psychodynamics of schizophrenia, which, which I am too, contrary to rumor. Uh, I can buy 90% of what's in, uh, in from Reichman or uh, uh, Arietti's book. Uh, all I have to do is change the references to the specific etiology, and I can buy almost all the rest. Almost all the rest. I've just been rereading Arietti. I think it's a great book, terrific book. He's just wrong about mother did it. But uh, if I fix that up, I can go along with almost all the other connections. And the, the content as he characterizes it is very rich and certainly accords with my experience as a psychotherapist. But you need, I can list as many things I don't want an indicator to discriminate if I'm studying a, a neurological dominant gene theory of schizophrenia as I can things that I do want it to be. L literally, there are as many I don't want. And then finally, I want a pilot study reported fully or the main study to be replicated. And uh, uh, people don't usually do that. And uh, whether you should insist that uh, the individual uh, researcher should replicate his own thing with another batch of cases uh, is perhaps a little strong, but I think that would be a move in the right direction. Now, as to editors, referees, and journal policies, um, I would put a, a great emphasis upon the desirability of replication. And if the results are fairly marginal, I would uh, tend to put pressure on authors that, to, to replicate themselves with a second sample. On um, reporting results, I'm a fanatic on the tables. as must have been apparent several sessions back. I'm really a little batty on that subject. When I was a, when I was your age, it was customary to put the damn means and sigmas in the tables, almost always. And a journal like Patterson's would not accept a paper that didn't put them in. He would just tell the author, you have to tell the reader what the mean and standard deviation is. Uh, it has now become customary due to uh, people's uh, being hypnotized by Fisherian statistics that they don't tell you the mean and the sigma. They, more often than not, they don't tell you the variability. And uh, frequently they don't tell you the mean. Uh, and they give you this T or F over on the right-hand side. They don't give you a p-value either. Uh, they give you, they tell you whether it's significant or not. One star, two stars, three stars, or NS all of which I consider scandalous form of scientific reporting. It should be left up to you, the reader, to decide how impressed you are with this F of so-and-so. You, in, in fact, my preference is not even to state significance, get rid of this damn asterisk stuff, and just state the P. State the P. I want, let me decide whether I'm impressed with a P of 08 or a P of 02. Uh, but the Fisherians really brainwashed us in that respect. When I took the, uh, the uh, Ed Psych statistics course from Palmer O. Johnson, who was a smart man and well-trained and everything, but he, he had this rigid thing. He'd say, before you do any experiment, you realize that you have three alternatives, to accept the hypothesis, to reject the hypothesis, or to remain in doubt. That meant 01 or 05 or in between. 
And I remember as a graduate thinking, student thinking, now come on, 05, 07, what the hell? Um, uh, it really is unsanitary. So I favor going back to the habit of reporting all of the stuff that the reader might want. And I also favor uh, stating something about overlap and giving some indication as to distribution shape. They don't even tell you whether things are skew or not. Have you noticed? It could, and in psychopathology, they're almost always skewed. There's practically nothing we measure in the area of mental illness in which both the normals and the patients have a symmetrical curve. Schizophrenics are always A, more variable than normals, and B, uh, skew, and frequently platycurtic. And, uh, and nothing is ever linear. But uh, people don't tell you any of that stuff. You sit there, you look at this, and you can't even, if you're willing to go through the mental uh, exercise yourself, you frequently cannot reconstruct what the situation is from the way that the data are currently reported. I also favor confidence intervals. I like confidence intervals better than significance levels. And since there's a certain algebraic interchangeability between those two, uh, why not uh, give somebody the confidence interval and uh, uh, he can restate it if he wants in terms of uh, uh, significance from some cut point. As to overlap, I, I don't care exactly how you do it. I, the way I was raised was by Patterson who said we should have a standard set of points. The 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile of the reference group and you should report in your article what percentage of the experimental group or the abnormal group or the treated group or whatever what percent uh, percents of that second group reached or exceeded those five percentiles in the reference group especially is this true in, in the area of clinical and industrial where a reader may be in a different situation from the investigator as regards the base rate of a condition or the size of the of the uh, selection ratio uh, in a military or industrial setting and therefore would be interested in what percent he gets at a different cutting score of the other group than the investigator was and for that reason those are not uh, those are not causally interesting parameters, but they're interesting from the, uh, from the practical standpoint of patient care or uh, uh, optimal selection of personnel in the Navy and things like this. And since you don't know what uh, the reader's uh, needs will be as regards uh, selection ratio or what uh, disutilities may be attached in a particular clinic, what the policy may be with regard to prolonged treatment or dangerous and painful treatments and so on. Some people don't ever like to use shock therapy. Others uh, use it at the drop of a hat. A little more careful these days than they used to be. Um, uh, the reader should be uh, in the position to say, well, I, I really want to know how many people I squeak by at the, at the 10th percentile. And some other reader might say, well, I care about the median of the, uh, of the reference group. Whether something like the tilt and overlap statistics should always be required, I don't want to argue about the merits of the tilt and thing. That, of course, assumes that the two distributions are both Gaussian. Um, percent of variance accounted for in the case where you have uh, a design that permits you to state it that way. Uh, there is a little problem about regression equations because of the temptation to assume that a beta weight is always a causal weight influence, which it certainly is not. Uh, it may sometimes be, of course, but other considerations have to be raised before one knows whether to attach uh, a causal weight to, to a beta coefficient. I assume you all know that. I mean, the easiest way to say it is just realizing that uh, if you put some more variables into the system and take some others out, you'll get a different beta. And uh, it seems hard to imagine that uh, uh, that represents a different uh, amount of causal impact because that means it's a function of what you measured. And presumably omniscient Jones knows that the causality is the way it is uh, rather than uh, what the experimenter measured. Then I have a, I have a, a crazy idea that uh, every journal should have a section at the end for negative pilot studies. Now, am I right? There is a journal that does that. I think there's an experimental journal that, that holds you down to like one page and it just doesn't ring any bells. Well, maybe I'm wrong about that. 
Uh, I don't know that that's true in any of the soft area journals. Uh, I favor uh, each area, like the Journal of Clinical or the Journal of Counseling or whatever, would have a section at the end which would be for pilot studies that came out negative uh, uh, as a result of which the investigator decided not to do the big study. So that's a way of getting around that, that business we mentioned, that uh, the pilot study is one that was in the universe, but it never surfaced in the literature. And this would not be burdensome when you have done a pilot study that's a decent pilot, st pilot study, I mean, that enables you to, to uh, answer the question of what uh, effect size you were going to expect and what degrees of freedom you needed. It is a miniature of the big study, right? And so if it's a decent pilot study, you have put in that time and effort. And uh, if it were held down to very short reporting, one page or two pages, um, I think people would send it in. I mean, it's a reflex with college professors to send things in, isn't it? Uh, what do you do? You publish. Uh, um, <laughs> I had a Freudian slip <laughs> a while back. I was saying, oh, it's marvelous. I said to my wife, I meant to say, I, I, I told you about this last week when we were discussing it, and I said, well, I published that last week when we were discussing it. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> well, the point is, if somebody's taken the time and effort to do the study, and then uh, you know that uh, instead of just dropping in the wastebasket and saying, well, that's one that didn't get me anywhere, now I'll do something else. Uh, if it's a very short paper, uh, you've analyzed it. It's not that you didn't do the statistics, you didn't find out it, that it wouldn't work without doing them. So all you need is to sit down with your pencil paper, your dictating machine, and write a two-page thing. And uh, that goes in your track record. and down in the tablets of Jade in the dean's office and so on. And so uh, I think the probability of people publishing negative pilot studies would be very high because it's a painless way of getting another publication out of a study that uh, you have put in a lot of time. You put in many more hours uh, doing the darn thing and doing the statistics than you will both take you to write a one or two page summary. Yeah, just on a little practical level, save someone else from spending two, three, very important. Think of all the... Yes, that's a very good point. I, be, I should have mentioned that when I was talking about pilot studies. I talked as if there was only one. But remember, there's a certain antecedent plausibility to certain types of experiments, right? I mean, if you're interested in Fisbee's theory of the mind, it's rather natural to think, well, let's use anagrams here or whatever. And there you got all these people... Uh, uh, assistant professors trying to get tenure and graduate students getting their PhD who are doing the same pilot study that somebody did over here at West Overshoe and somebody here in Minneapolis and somebody here in Tel Aviv and so on and none of these pilot studies is surfacing and so uh, that's a terrible uh, a waste of IQ and taxpayer dollars yes so I'd make it short and easy and not too fussy I mean you'd have some rules about what you have to describe but uh, you don't have to solve the mind-body problem. It can be very brief, and it just says, this is what I did, and here are the results, and I am not going to pursue this line of investigation further. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I, do you think that the convention to some extent helps us a little bit from a failure to surface? That's probably true. That's probably true. I don't go to conventions anymore, uh, 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 partly because uh, I can't follow the, I can't follow the uh, account. I don't know about you. Even when I was younger, I had trouble with that. I mean, somebody got 12 minutes to tell you about this thing and show you these tables and flick, 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 like that. I can't track it. I can't. I, mean, I, just, I used to think I had some defect in this regard, and I started asking other people, and, oh, of course not. It's a hell of a way to communicate. Yeah, you can't flick. <laughs> it, you, the mind simply cannot assimilate uh, a complicated design, and he's putting up the F-tests, and he's telling you about the analysis of covariance and so forth, and he has to talk fast. 
and uh, they're always running behind, <laughs> 10 minutes behind. Okay, that's for editors, journals, and referees. Um, well, I don't know why this is different. It's the same subject. Um, uh, uh, stressing the, the reviewers should stress the power function. Oh, I mean, I mean reviewers now of the published literature, yes. Should stress the power. I mentioned before, they don't even mention it usually. Once in a while, your usual bulletin review literally doesn't allude to the, the power of the various studies. And that means that unless, and that means it doesn't really perform its summary function for you because since it doesn't tell you, the only way you will know whether that box score is partly attributable to variation in power is if you go back and read the original papers, which defeats the purpose of the bulletin article. It's to fix it. That's supposed to fix you so that you don't have to do that unless, uh, well, even if it is your own area, you don't go back and read all of them. But if I'm reading the psych bulletin to learn a little bit something about how cognitive psychology is going, which I don't know much of anything about, uh, I'm not going to go and read 120 studies to see what the power is. So that if the reviewer doesn't even give me a hint about that, uh, how, what do I learn? Um, there should be, uh, in reviews, some way of emphasizing for the reader that... Uh, the box score uh, may not tell us a heck of a lot about the theory's verisimilitude. They almost never say anything about that. And I suppose that's partly because they haven't taken this course, but there may be some other reasons. And you sort of get the impression that most reviewers of article uh, areas uh, they seem to kind of feel that uh, as long as the uh, as long as a theory is uh, coming out with a batting average bigger than 50-50, that it's got quite a bit going for it. Um, and I don't suppose I need to emphasize that that, from a Popperian or Lakatosian standpoint, is not the case, uh, and that a theory which uh, comes out right uh, two out of three experiments, or even three out of four experiments. Uh, uh, is if the auxiliaries were uh, granted not in good shape at all, having now been refuted. Um, that's too strong because of Lakatosh amendments to Popper, but you have to start seeing the Popperian point and then watering it down. Most psychologists are not up to Popper yet. i got to convince them all about Popper, and then afterwards Lakatosh can soften it up. Uh, but it, it's simply not the case that a 60-40 split or a 70-30 split plus to minus in soft psychology uh, is a strong P, is strong evidence for the theory's truth or for its high verisimilitude for the reasons that we've gone through. There can't be any cutting score on box scores, that's obvious. You, you, it would be, you, you certainly wouldn't want anybody uh, to buy in on a tough pop area line and say something comparable to the alpha business, moving significance level over into the other side of that box I passed out and saying, well, we won't count a theory as supported unless it has a box score of 9 to 1 or something like that. Any such, any such rigid statement of a, of a nose counting procedure would be malignant. Uh, all I am arguing is it should be moved up. It should be. You should. You should not be taking a lot of heart in the theory's verisimilitude when it gets box scores in this two-thirds to three-fourths uh, range, which seems to be typical in the soft areas. I plan to do a little statistical study of that, but you don't really have to do the statistics. Just keep reading articles in the bulletin. I would say it's. I'm sure it's somewhere between uh, 65 and uh, 80. Somewhere in there is what the box score looks like when you simply count, did we squeak by alpha or did we not? And 65% or 70% plus uh, cannot be looked upon methodologically as being in good shape. That is not strong evidence for the verisimilitude of the theory.
Now, theoreticians, can I give them any, any helpful advice? Um, I think that I think that we are um, somewhat. We have a funny combination of optimism and pessimism. I believe I mentioned this before. That is, we are overly optimistic about what you prove when you do a significance test. But when pressed to do something more than that, psychologists in the soft areas at least tend to be pessimistic about whether you could do any better than that. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to do any better than that. I don't know how hard it is. We won't know until people start trying it more than they presently do. So you've got to make us, the profession has to be made nervous first. You know, it's like the old Trotskyist principle. Things have to get worse before they can get better. And you've got to make people nervous about this t-test, h-null business, before they will focus their brains on, well, what could we do that would be a little more powerful? Now, Professor Telligan was in my office uh, uh, just before class, uh, pointing out that he had recently analyzed some of his data and uh, which he had made pairwise predictions between certain things, so uh, said that uh, the A's should be better than the B's, and the B's should be better than the C's, and the C's should be better than the D's, and so forth. And he wondered uh, whether I was too uh, hard-nosed a Popperian to admit that that was uh, corroborative evidence, and I, I merely hauled out my two nights paper and showed him the abstract, which says that while it's true that in the history of the physical sciences, numerical point predictions have been the most impressive, that other things such as rank orderings, function forms, stipulations as to peaks and valleys and so forth, are also very powerful. The point prediction thing happens to be peachy keen, one, because you can narrow it down so much and you can quantify the improbability of being that close, if you are willing to allow the Spielraum idea. But uh, a prediction of uh, function forms to say that this ought to be decelerated or this ought to be sigmoid or if it's sort of ogival, it's not a symmetrical ogive, it should, uh, ha it's, uh, uh, its flex point should be considerably to the left of the middle of the range, and statements of that kind are uh, perfectly admissible as, as strong Popperian tests. Uh, so point predictions, numerical point predictions, is simply the ideal that I happen to focus on. And it's the one that was very impressive in the history of the other sciences. It's what impresses you about Mendelian genetics and chemistry and astronomy and so forth. But there are a lot of examples in the history of physics. In the early days of the old quantum theory, for instance, I don't remember how, which experiment this was now, but in any physics book you can see a, there's a famous graph in which something goes like this. And that's all they had in the points. Or maybe this was the Compton effect. Whatever it was, the theory, again, was not uh, strong enough to make uh, uh, parametric uh, statements, but it said that a certain kind of scattering of the electrons or whatever ought to show you a big curve, and then it ought to show you displaced away from it, a sh smaller one, and then displaced still further away, a itty bitty one. And you go in the lab, and there it is. That's the way the electrons act. And that, that didn't require a numerical point prediction, but uh, if you think in terms of in terms of uh, prior probabilities, and uh, uh, ask yourself, well, if it was all mud, what's the probability that I would get three uh, non-overlapping curves, and what's the probability that their heights would go down one, two, three, like that, and what's the probability that this difference should be smaller than this difference? Very important kind of. Confirmation involves uh, so-called second-order deltas, as the mathematician calls it, where I have values x1, x2, and so on, and then I have delta x1, 2, delta x2, 3, and so forth, and then I have these third-order deltas, the kind of stuff that they work out when they do interpolation extrapolation theory. And uh, sometimes I can have a theory that may be powerful enough to say something about the way these deltas relate, even though I am still not able to make numerical point predictions uh, at the, of the x's themselves. So uh, if Telegon uh, could be mixed up about that, uh, or my, my views on that, then maybe some of you are. So let me emphasize, I am not saying.
only numerical point predictions. That would be madness. Anything that will constitute a strong Popperian risk. And since Popper is in bad odor among some philosophers these days, I'll, I don't even insist on putting it that way. I, I, I'll switch it and talk with like Salmon and just say anything that's a damn strange coincidence. So we don't even talk about risk. If you don't like the idea of risk because that implies falsification and the theories are all false anyway, all right, we won't do it that way. We'll just say anything that gives you a damn strange coincidence. And that doesn't have to be numerical point values, although those are the peachy keen ones, um, like the Avogadro's number example. We did talk about Avogadro's number, yes. Um, so I think if we, if the, if the psychologist, the soft areas uh, got cured of his uh, obsession with uh, significance testing and said we really should try to do something a little stronger than that, um, then it would be possible to uh, uh, make predictions even from rather weak theories. I think there's a tendency to believe that, oh, how could we could never do that. The mind is, we could just never do that. All we can ever do is say the A's are bigger than the B's or the girls talk faster than the boys or whatever. We can never make anything like that. And I repeat that you have to try. And if you don't try, you don't know what you can do. And there are a lot of things in the history of, of physics and chemistry where in the early stages they didn't make these parametric predictions. They just said that certain graphs ought to have a certain rough kind of shape. There's a very famous one involving, uh, what is it, Vian's Law or whatever, in which uh, the early days of quantum theory, in which uh, the prediction was that the, uh, the distribution of energies at certain wavelengths, so what you're plotting here is uh, ergs for a given wavelength band, was going to be some a function of the fifth power of the wavelength, lambda's the wavelength. Some function was all that was derivable. It wasn't strong enough to do anything better than that. Some function of the fifth power. And that would be independent of the Kelvin temperature. That was the prediction. Well, what do they do? They go in the lab and they get the uh, uh, 1,000... Uh, degrees Kelvin and 2,000 uh, degrees Kelvin and 4,000 degrees. This is this cavity radiation business that got the whole quantum business started with Planck and company. And uh, what happens? Well, uh, crazy thing goes sort of like this. Uh, say at 1,000 degrees Kelvin and then uh, at 2,000 degrees Kelvin you get something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, 4,000, you get uh, these fellas <laughs> very close to a smooth curve that you would draw with a French curve, but the, you don't know what that function is. It had two peaks, had a hollow in here. This one was more peaked. I haven't drawn it quite. This one was more peaked than this. You can draw a smooth curve eyeballing it with a French curve. And, uh, well, beautiful, beautiful, see? Clearly it these different temperatures for your for your furnace, um, the amount of energy corresponding to a certain w wavelength was some function, namely this goofy thing, of lambda to the fifth. Well, damn strange coincidence, right? I mean, if that, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine how you would get to that if this theory didn't have any verisimilitude. And the physical sciences give us numerous examples uh, like that. So I just don't think that we are working hard enough at uh, that uh, type of thing. You can uh, strive for a center of intermediate strength of theorizing. Uh, in that original list, uh, when I was talking about the comparing two theories as to uh, how much Jones's agrees with Smith's and then how much each agrees with uh, omniscient Jones's theory, and I listed which variables, which kind of entities there are which ones are connected with which, either compositionally or by efficient causality, as Aristotle would call it. 
Uh, if they're connected by efficient causality, uh, uh, what's the f is the sign of the first derivative positive? Is the sign of the second derivative positive? Is a change? Uh, if we have several variables, we can compare the size of two partial derivatives and not know what the value of either one is. And we can continue specifying more and more, and then we get to the point of saying, well, it's not merely that I think this is a, a monotone increasing decelerated function, which could fit lots of things, logarithmic power function with the exponent less than one um, growth function. Hmm? Uh, but I say, uh, well, I think it's a hyperbola, but I don't know the constants. And then finally we say, well, and I don't, it's a hyperbola, and the constants are as follows. There's a real potent theory when you can do that. So, one, you don't want to start out be, being grandiose uh, uh, and give the theory a black eye, not to, plus wasting time by saying more than you can. Uh, Clark Hull fell into that when he started talking about habs and watts and motes uh, and paths of inhibition, and shortly before his death, he was trying to work out a metric of uh, habit strength and so on, and it, uh, a, lot of some, a lot of effort went into it, and it uh, didn't pan out. So, uh, quoting my friend Feigl again, don't bother, don't try to cut butter with a razor. And so we are dealing with butter here, and we don't need a razor. But the point is we can get by a big, past the stage of a big wooden spoon, uh, which is what the significance test is, okay? Well, what can you say about, uh, about Ph.D. training programs that might help this? Uh, I have some thoughts on that which are not very well received by some of my colleagues. In fact, some of my colleagues get more irritated by them than the students do, which makes me feel encouraged because you're going to take over. Um, I think that we should require... <coughs> Uh, for research psychologists a uh, good deal of more mathematics than we do and uh, rather than make somebody take a whole uh, year course of uh, statistics uh, the last uh, the third quarter which is, uh, is fancy Fisherian designs I would be more inclined to make it a little shorter on the statistics and make them learn a little bit of general probability theory and calculus and elementary matrix algebra and that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, this is partly because of my feeling that, uh, and I use the word feeling this here deliberately, uh, feeling that a person who doesn't know a little bit of elementary mathematics uh, is sort of uneducated. I mean, it's, not, it's like not recognizing uh, some passages out of Beethoven or uh, Hamlet's soliloquy and not to know what a derivative is. But that's just a personal bias of mine about culture. Uh, uh, there's a vicious circle operates here, which I've, I think, mentioned before. If the, if the student reads the journals and realizes he doesn't need to know any mathematics but only knows how to do a t-test, um, then it's uh, hardly, uh, you can hardly expect the student to be motivated to give this a high priority. And secondly, his role model, his advisor, doesn't know any mathematics either except how to do a t-test. So that's a vicious circle. I don't fault the students for this. Uh, uh, if my advisor doesn't know any math and uh, the articles in the Journal of, uh, uh, of uh, Interpersonal Ceramics doesn't include any math, why, why should I learn any math? I mean, that's fairly obvious. Uh, when I was chairman, I tried to get in a math requirement for an undergraduate major and uh, failed. So I figure if I couldn't convince him when I was chair, I sure as heck am not going to try to work on it now. My view is that there ought to be a mathematics requirement for undergraduate psych majors, provided it isn't a general citizenship major. And I favor a general citizenship major. I'm not against that like some people. I mean, I think there should be a sort of general culture major in psychology for people who do not plan to go on to graduate school or to become practitioners of it, uh, and, uh, but who will be voters and parents and taxpayers like that. And I figure psychology is at least as useful for that as a major in, uh, in uh, Portuguese. So I believe in a, in a general education psych major, and for those people I would not have a math requirement. <laughs>
I would plug in a little biology for them. But I, wouldn't, I would not require a math requirement. But for people who said, I'm going on to get a PhD in psychology, then I would insist that they have uh, some sort of uh, math requirement, whether it's taught in the department or in the math department. It used to be hard to get any mathematics uh, because you had to take, uh, in calculus, you had to take 10 credits. And uh, five credits of differential and five credits of integral. And the differential and the integral calculus, of course, was never about anything in social science. It was always about the volume of footballs and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, well, of course, you learn how to do integration. You learn is when you see that sign with the uh, zero to infinity world, you don't faint like some social scientists. But uh, uh, it's been made a lot easier. Uh, you look at the, in the math department's listing of courses, and there are four or five different avenues that you can take and end up at least knowing what a, what a double integral uh, is about. Well, that's a special <coughs> attitude of mine that I have, after all these years, become mellow and decided that it's impossible to persuade people, and so the heck with it. Um, um, secondly, I would think it would be nice if psychology students could learn, r read a little bit about the classic experiments in the other great sciences, and uh, especially read the derivation chains that go into these experiments. Uh, it is not necessary for you to be a hotshot in physics and know a lot of math to read, say, Millikan's little book on the electron. And it's still around. It's Dover publications, and uh, if you don't want to fight through all the argument about, what is it, Stokes' equation, uh, with this drop going through here, and uh, what's the approximation to the viscosity, you can skip that, except the point about reading some of those classic things is to give you some idea what a really powerful science looks like, especially the relationship between the mathematics and the interpretative text. And I've run into psychologists who have never taken a single science, other science, biological or, or uh, physical uh, or math, since high school. And uh, they, they seem to me to be quite maleducated. That is, they've never taken at the college level chemistry or physics or astronomy or geology or calculus, uh, maybe botany they took. Uh, and uh, I just feel that you are, I really believe that you are somewhat disadvantaged if you're going to do theory and wonder about how we can make psychological theory more scientifically respectable if you don't have any model of what a really powerful scientific theory is like. What does it look like? How do they get from A to B to C? When they have an approximation, how do they do that? What happens if they can't solve the math? That will relax you, actually, that part of it. I mean, if you read almost any derivation in a physics book, it'll say, oh, yeah, this, is, you know, this formalism here becomes intractable, and so we instead express this as an infinite series, and we dropped all the terms past the fourth because those derivatives are small. It's just routine. Uh, and uh, all we say, we'll assume that these particles are round, although they're not quite round, and uh, we're going to assume that the viscosity varies with the blah, blah, blah. And that should make you feel better about psychology. I mean, these people do it all the time. They do it all the time. Very, very free about that. But they're always concerned about the range of error that they will tolerate when they make those idealizations. So when they drop some terms out of an expansion of some function, they ask, well, it converges now. Do we know uh, what, how big a black eye are we going to get if we ignore all the terms past the second power? And they can put bounds on that. And then maybe in the derivation, they, they keep doing that so that the, you will find uh, on page 3 that he has said, now, this could be off by point 0.13 because we have carried through the following error as an upper bound due to the approximation to Fisbee's constant, and now it's popped up here. And that gives, that's, uh, it, gives you, uh, it gives you the realization that you don't always have to be uh, doing... Uh, uh, things that are accurate to the ninth decimal place, and that uh, you know the other sciences, idealizations of the concepts and approximations in the mathematics are uh, very widely found. I mean, they're not universal, but damn near universal. Uh, 
I would be nervous if the only other science that a psych major took uh, for this propaganda purpose was physics. I really think that we uh, have overdone that everything has to look like physics. And there are a lot of other very respectable enterprises that don't read like physics. I mean, there are categorical sciences, and there are qualitative uh, laws around, and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, three broad kinds of scientific theories, that I don't know if I mentioned that before, did I? Three different kinds of scientific theories, functional dynamic theories, compositional theories, and developmental theories. And some of the compositional and developmental ones are certainly very respectable. You wouldn't spit on the theory of evolution because it doesn't look like physics. You might have some complaints about it for other reasons, as I do, but uh, you wouldn't spit on it because it doesn't look like uh, Kepler or uh, classical mechanics. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of what you learn in chemistry is compositional, of course. What is something made out of? Uh, biological sciences, in many respects, have quite different properties explanatorily and of the kind of math that's appropriate from, from a course in thermodynamics or uh, electricity. So it would trouble me if the only model science, so to speak, the psychology student uh, looked at was physics because he would uh, he would get a misconception that the only good sciences are the ones that read F equals M A or like Maxwell's equations. Whether it's useful to read the history of science, I do not know. I myself have found it extremely useful in my own thinking about uh, things like schizophrenia and behavior genetics and learning theory, but uh, I am aware that that happens to be a avocational thing with me and uh, I saw, so I'm not going to argue that that the perspective given by studying the history of science is necessarily valuable I think it's been helpful to me is all I'll say um, I believe it would help our discipline as to the quality of what is published if the current emphasis on, on uh, publish or perish uh, was uh, reduced considerably. Uh, I, I, I have talked a little about this before, and Dave Licken makes a, normally he tells me, makes a fiery oration on it when he comes in this class. Um, I believe that... Uh, one that recognizes that there are multiple incentives for any human activity and that to rely upon the scientists to do work uh, solely out of pure intellectual need cognizance would be somewhat unrealistic, although I'm impressed that the people who do the most interesting things, that seems to be the most powerful motive. That is, they are actuated like the little kid who wants to know how this clock works. And... Uh, I think that the people who are mainly uh, oriented towards uh, getting a prize uh, or uh, to helping mankind are not the ones that do the most interesting things. Uh, helping mankind is Peachy Keen's spinoff that you mentioned to the legislature, and it's admirable. But uh, I don't think that the social workers' a set of passions tends to predominate in highly productive scientists. And there are some hard data on that, as I'm sure you're aware. The, some of the internal properties of the strong, even tell us about that. And uh, Ann Rowe's study of distinguished scientists tells us about that. In Aerosmith, he's trying to help mankind. In reality, he's trying to get the Nobel Prize or make full professor or beat out Jones. Now, I'm not objecting to that mix of motives. I, uh, I agree with David Hume that reason is the slave of the passions, and he didn't mean that in the sense of a rationalization. However, uh, I really believe, and uh, a lot of people are agreeing with me these days, that today there's something about the academic culture that has become almost sick as regards uh, 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 length of publications. Uh, one of the main forms it takes now is 37 authors in a single paper, and it turns out that all Joe Blow ever had to do with it was to say, yup, and um, <laughs> it's really become absurd. Um, and uh, the uh, pressure when you're hiring a, a fresh big PhD uh, is to look at how many publications that person had before, and he hasn't even finished his thesis yet. 
when I see somebody with 20 pre-PhD publications, in fact, I tend to get a little suspicious. I mean, how good can they be, after all? But uh, uh, I, uh, I really think that it's bad for people's mental health that there's a lot of uh, needless ulcers in the academy. And uh, it is also bad for the taxpayer because in the social sciences, a very large part of it is no good. Um, I, d I was always sympathetic, although ambivalent, about old Proxmire with his golden fleece. What uh, irritated me about him was that he thought that he knew enough to decide when something uh, deserved it, which he damn well didn't. Uh, but the idea that there should be a Golden Fleece Award in the social sciences, I certainly agree with. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think that if we, that one of the reasons that will, one of the factors that will inhibit people from looking at theory testing in a, in a more rational way is that it's going to be harder to publish if you did. That's rather obvious, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you did not think that refuting H. Null was a big chunk of support for Fisbee's theory, uh, then it would uh, be a little bit harder uh, for you to have these 27 articles you need to make uh, to get promoted to tenure rank. I have very radical views on this, I might tell you. I do not even hold that everybody in a first-rate psych department should have to publish. And... Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only member of this entire faculty who takes that view. I think it should be possible for somebody to make full professor because he's a good teacher or a skilled clinician, and uh, it used to be possible. And I had a whole bunch of teachers when I was your age that hardly published anything, and they were very smart and scholarly and widely read, and I learned a lot from them. And these, are, these guys simply couldn't, couldn't be at this, in this university today because they don't have this big list of things. So I'm against the whole business, uh, but uh, there again, I don't seem to get very many takers on that. Um, Do you see that changing at all? I mean, I've read some Improving any? Mm -hmm. um, there, just recently, there's been some reports that said there needs to be more of an emphasis on teaching and, and less of an emphasis you on see, You see things in... Uh, in uh, various uh, scientific and semi-popular scientific journals that people are starting to talk a little bit more this way. I, I think that is true. But when it comes to actually implementing it in a given department, everybody gets terribly nervous. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we had an assistant professor in this department named Vern Devine, who was an extremely gifted clinician, a behavior modifier, but not of the rigid type, uh, as he was interested in what the patient was thinking once in a while. And uh, uh, he 60% uh, fixed the patient that I had treated psychoanalytically with Zilt's results. Uh, and the students liked him very much, and he enjoyed doing supervision, which nobody in this building likes to do. I did it for 10 years, and I'm never, ever, ever going to do it again. I'll never do it again. i never going to do it again. Uh, and and uh, he was a role model of a scholarly, uh, a nurturant, skilled clinician. And he quit and went down to work full time for uh, Ramsey, uh, be, uh, for Hennepin County, because he knew he wasn't going to get tenure uh, because he was not turning out these, these papers. Uh, I look upon that as a mistake. I look upon it as bad for the training program. Uh, one of the things that makes it very bad for the training program in clinical, I don't know if counseling has this problem too, industrial apparently doesn't, but in clinical, what happens is that the clinical students, those who are strongly practice oriented, uh, begin to make a division in their head between these uh, people in Elliot who are smart and fun to talk with and who write these papers. And you came to Minnesota because it had some famous psychologists and it, it's a good place to get a PhD out of. But uh, uh, hardly any of them are seeing patients. And if they are, we don't hear about it. Um, I think Butcher and I are the only clinicians in this building that do any private practice to any appreciable extent. And then what does the student begin to do? Well, he goes out in his clerkship and his internship, 
And there are the people who were really out there laying on hands and fighting in the firing line and talking about uh, this patient and that patient and what we should do and what are the indications and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so what the student does, unless he has unusual powers of synthesis, uh, what the student does is, this is if somebody sectioned his, cut his corpus callosum, and he's got, well, over here we have these admittedly bright scholarly people that write the papers, and they told me some worthwhile things. And then over here we got the real clinicians who work with people and try to help them. And now I'm out here in the field, and this is the role model that I'm identifying with. And that means that all the stuff I learned uh, in Elliott Hall goes into this other basket and is closed. And that means that if the role model that I admire in the clinic happens to be a mush head, which roughly half of them will be, the other half won't, but half of them will be four-lane muddle heads. Uh, and that means that all I learned about quantification and thinking critically and scientifically goes into this other box over here. So now all I'm doing is drawing fallacious inference from the uh, tennis ball projective test and, uh, <laughs> and so forth like that. And you can see it happen. You can watch it. You talk to a student that you talked to two years ago. He comes back from the internship, and his mind has been fixed. Uh, <laughs> he's been warped. And uh, one of the reasons that the warping takes place is that there's this sectioning in the, the two boxes. There's the scientific box. That's good for these people at Elliott Hall. Good for them. That's Peachy Keen. I get my PhD in Minnesota. And then over here is the real world. And uh, very bad. Very bad. As it's bad for the patients, too, because that means that that student goes around and he swallows the 50% that uh, his role model in the clinic has that's true, and he also f swallows the 50 cents that's baloney, and he treats the patients on the basis of the baloney as well. Uh, because somehow uh, there's other stuff about quantification and probability and inferences. And, uh, uh, is, uh, what does that have to do with anything? I, I, I got my Ph.D., I did my dissertation. Yes, well, there may be some, may be some improvement. But one of the things that has led the scientific community, and I'm not just talking about social science, Bob, but medical science, to be worried about this pressure is the surfacing of fraud, which now nobody knows whether it's just that it's surfacing more or that there is more fraud being committed. I don't believe anybody has any way to answer that question, whether there's some uh, corruption of the scientific superego uh, that has occurred, um, uh, that the culture is uh, going down the tube, uh, glug, 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 as regards ethics, and that uh, scientific ethics goes down the tube just like every other kind. Um, and uh, maybe it's harder to get by with it in science, but uh, you can do it. You can fake data, so, or you can steal your students' ideas, and so on. Well, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, uh, a long uh, manuscript uh, called The Seven Sacred Cows of Academia, uh, which I have been writing for four or five years now, and which I dare say I'll never finish writing, but... Uh, uh, but uh, one of the seven sacred cows of academia is a statement, uh, most research published by college professors is worth doing. Um, these seven sacred cows are not things I know to be false. I just know that nobody's proved them to be true. And they're believed by practically all professors, and they have to be believed by deans and the university presidents uh, for conversation with the legislature. Maybe I'll pass out my list at least next time of the seven sacred cows. Um, well, you don't have to share my view about uh, about having uh, tenured faculty that are mainly teachers and uh, practitioners to agree with me at least that the current state of psychic pressure is uh, pathological in in character. It's really not good for people's mental health, and I am, I do not believe it is good for the advancement of the science. I think that uh, it results in a large amount of what Lakatos calls intellectual pollution. When you do evaluate uh, publications, which you have to if you're an administrator, I, I'm not uh, trying to say that uh, we don't have to pay attention to, quote, productivity. It's just that I reject the identification of scientific productivity with papers with scholarship. 
which is the way the dean takes it. Scholarship equals productivity equals papers. But if, to the extent that a department chair or a promotion committee must evaluate uh, publication and promoting faculty or deciding whether to retain them, and there's a retention case, there should be more emphasis upon uh, the science citation index and less upon sheer yardage. The social science citation index and the natural science citation index, which overlap with regard to certain journals, like the psychiatry journals, uh, is, like everything else, an imperfect way of finding out your contribution. But it's generally agreed by historians of science and people in the field of scientific communication that at least if you are not cited, you are not making much of a contribution. Now, the other side of that coin is not so obvious. You may be cited because you say something dumb and a lot of people bother to refute you. I could name some names, but I will not. Uh, but uh, if, 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 a, if a scientific paper is not paid any attention to by the members of the scientific community, then practically by definition you had no impact, right? If nobody had ever unearthed Mendel, then the <laughs> but uh, if, 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 a, if a scientific paper is not paid any attention to by the members of the scientific community, then practically by definition you had no impact, right? If nobody had ever unearthed Mendel, then Mendel would not have made an impact. If nobody had ever read Darwin, he would not have made an impact. And uh, the, uh, there are some, quote, validation studies of the uh, index of scientific citations. Uh, uh, one of the better ones is by the late Canadian uh, psychologist uh, C. Uh, C. E. Myers, C. S. Myers. Well, it's Myers anyway. In the American Psychologist, maybe 10 years ago now. And uh, what he did was to take uh, citation counts of uh, people in the journals and uh, look at other criteria that people generally admit, at least in an average sense, are indicators of scientific attainment, such as reception of various prizes and awards, uh, election to uh, offices in the professional societies, that means somewhat less today for a number of reasons than it once did, but uh, and there are various other kinds of things you could mention that, uh, that correlate really quite remarkably well, at least at the high end. Uh, and the distribution of numbers of citations in his data are fascinating. If you take people who, who uh, in referee, major referee journals are cited five times in a five-year span. That's only once a year. Now, uh, that's a pretty low cutting score. The average age of these people would be about 45, and uh, they're publishing an average of, uh, say, two papers a year. And so they got 40 papers out, and uh, one paper cited per year on an average. I am not setting the world on fire. Uh, where is that? That's at the 94th percentile of cited people, of cited people. That leaves out all the people that publish that don't get cited, and it leaves out all the people that uh, write articles that don't get published, at least not in referee journals. So there's an awful lot of people busily doing research out here at the taxpayer's expense because they have to at least work at it to get promoted. Uh, and that res a lot of that research doesn't get completed or written up, and then a lot of that that gets written up doesn't get accepted by referee journals, and then of that that gets accepted, a lot of it doesn't get cited. We have data on that, too. There are quite a few papers. In the case of medicine, one year, one study showed 40% of the articles in one of the big medical journals that was not cited by anybody except the author in the ensuing five-year period. <laughs> uh, and so you got a lot that are in but are not cited. Now if you take only people who get cited, those who get cited an average of once a year for something that they wrote in a five-year period are at the 94th percentile. Very impressive, very impressive kind of uh, graph. My conclusion is that if it were not for this publisher Perry's syndrome that to make uh, uh, an associate professor you have to grind out these papers and books. Uh, if, say, uh, my figure, I figure is conservative, if four out of five people quit doing this, the science would no be, no, be no worse off. <laughs>
If four out of five quit doing this, uh, the psychology would not be hurt. Question. You mentioned that these people generally were the points of bringing these articles that were uh, less quantitative than that. No, I didn't say generally. I said that was a median value. Okay, a median value. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible that uh, part of that is because a lot of them are tenured in pressures off and that they, they are a little free to do some sort of quality work? Or is that pressure continued in? Uh, it depends on uh, the uh, falling off. Uh, there have been some studies of that, and it doesn't fall off as much as you would expect. Uh, what you get is people who publish just barely enough to get promoted to a tenure rank, say at a sort of marginal institution, tend to be the ones that quit. The uh, people who uh, publish enough uh, that has an impact uh, tend either because they're having fun or because they're very high NH types, uh, to keep doing it. They keep doing it. Uh, we, the, the extreme example of that is Nobel laureates. I mean, you might think, well, by God, that's the biggie. I got it made. I could just, uh, you know, uh, chase girls and go hunting and <laughs> so on. And, and that isn't the way it works. Uh, Nobel laureates keep uh, turning the stuff out, and uh, uh, some of them uh, suffer uh, bad reactions. It turns out uh, because uh, they have now got the mental set, what have you done for me lately? Um, uh, it's an incurable condition. Of course, I realize practically anybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have NH. And uh, I have a, most of my clientele as a therapist these days is academics. They all have this disease. They all have it. I mean, everybody thinks, I'm. Uh, what have I done lately? Um, uh, I practice enough uh, Albert Ellis and Buddhism uh, so uh, that I don't, I think, suffer as much from this disorder as, uh, as some people I know, but I suffer from it at times, and I have to do Albert Ellis and, and, and Buddhism, as I say, and they take a certain perspective of, after all, what the hell does it matter when the sun burns out? That's very helpful kind of uh, reflection. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but the notion, the notion that you aren't achieving or that you aren't achieving as much as you should or the other form when you get uh, various uh, ego pellets is that you don't deserve them and that you're not as good as people apparently must think you are. So that uh, that one has uh, bad effects upon people. I remember Nevin Sanford telling me in their study of personality at IPAR uh, that... <laughs> They had, they got a bunch of really distinguished people to serve as subjects in their research at IPAR. Uh, top flight brain surgeons around San Francisco area and distinguished chemists and poets and composers and not all scientists, in other words. And part of the procedure was, was a short uh, semi-psychoanalytic procedure, since Nevitt Sanford is an analyst. Uh, and uh, so they would put this uh, brain surgeon on the couch. And m mind you, these people had volunteered merely as uh, subjects. They were not coming in uh, manifestly for any kind of help with their neurosis. Uh, of course, maybe some of them cooperated with for that reason. But they were, a, they were high achiever, high visible people in the community without at least manifest diagnosable uh, uh, mental disorders. And Sanford told me once... Uh, at an APA meeting, he said, I, you know, Paul, I can hardly believe it. I, I wondered if what, if, is there something funny about this sample? Because they were all, except for one or two successful psychopaths, they were all talking the same way. I mean, they were lying there on the couch, and they were saying things like, well, of course, I got to be head of uh, neurosurgery at the age of uh, 39, which is unusual, and I... Uh, uh, but, you know, I really wonder sometimes, how did I, how did I fool all these people? You know, I'm really not that good. I'm mean, just not that good. And uh, uh, he said, I remember one a brain surgeon that was uh, washing up there, you know, and the nurse says, yes, doctor, yes, doctor, and so forth. And the thought passes through his mind, what the hell am I doing here? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and stick a knife into this guy's brain? What the hell do I do? <laughs> well, that's an extreme case. But... Uh, my experience with treating uh, college professors uh, is that the unsuccessful ones, the moderately successful and the super successful, all talk the same way in psychotherapy. I mean, they all think they're not doing quite as well as they could or should, given their IQ. 
or alternatively, how did I ever get to have such status as I, since I'm not as bright as my brother, whose IQ is 180, or the, the theme of how did I fool so many people, will they catch on to me that I'm not really as smart as I appear to be? practically universal. So if you have this disease, which 9 out of 10 of you have, just relax. It's par for the course. It's a normal state of the mind. It's only the lumpen proletariat that doesn't have that kind of thought, see? And if, you, if you didn't have some of that tendency, you wouldn't be sitting in this room. All right. Aside from the peculiarities of high achievers, if we paid more attention to citations and uh, and less to number of articles and books, number of pages, uh, so that people would realize uh, that their track record is being evaluated in terms of wh whether others in the scientific community pay a lot of attention to their work rather than uh, just how many articles. And th the Dean's Committee, which has to pass on department recommendations is in a very unfortunate situation here cognitively and I don't fault anybody for this because I don't know how to fix this but when you're evaluating say somebody in the psychology department then the psychology faculty in the committee have to leave the room which is understandable they're presumably in there pitching for their boy or girl well then who else in the room is now competent to assess the stuff see uh, well, maybe an economist uh, thinks that the statistics is not quite good in his article or whatever. And because of this oddity that the dean's committee uh, throws out the only people who know enough to know, uh, it degenerates into a number of papers or books count, even though you were told at the beginning when you serve on that, I've served on that committee, uh, you were told that you're not supposed to do that, but you do. And I have heard people say, yes, I know he wrote an article last year, but it was only three pages long. Literally, I heard that said. Well, you can't really fault them too much because they have no other basis for doing it. Not a satisfactory state of affairs. All right, one, those are my positive suggestions. And I, t I warned you I was not going to cure you or fix this problem up, but I think if... If uh, all of these things were done simultaneously, that the general uh, uh, level of, uh, of scientific theorizing and theory testing would be improved. Now, there is one other uh, major point that I have emphasized in the Kronbach Feshrift article, if it ever appears. And I don't think that I have talked about it in here, but if I have, it won't hurt to say it over again, because people tend not to, uh, psychology students tend not to, to believe this. And that is that um, there are important, worthwhile, meaningful scientific questions which it is impossible to answer at a given stage uh, of development. And it's a little strange to think that psychologists tend to assume the contrary about their enterprise when people in the more advanced sciences take this for granted. There's no controversy about this in astronomy or physics or chemistry. Uh, they take it for granted that there are certain scientific questions Mind you, scientific questions, not metaphysical ones in proper sense. Scientific questions which at this time we do not know how to answer. Either because we do not have the necessary embedding auxiliary theories that we would need, or because we do not have the kind of instruments of observation or control that we would need. And since we don't, we will just have to put this one aside and say this is a important thing someday we're going to find out about this maybe but we can't do it now and this is why we can't do it now what we would need to have is the following auxiliaries a1 a2 a3 and we would need to have an instrument capable of discriminating this finely or uh, seeing this far or responding that fast and we haven't got it and so we are not going to waste our time researching this admittedly interesting question because it wouldn't be profitable. Now, what, what happens to the psychology student, in my view, is that there is a combination of operationism about concepts 
and hence a sort of simple-minded verificationism about statements, which is then combined with the significance test business. And so the psych student tends to think that if, if, if he's asking something sensible at all, not just a muddled, goofy question or a metaphysical one, but a, a meaningful, empirical question, then, uh, since he was taught to uh, define your terms operationally, and that means that your theoretical statements can be verified, and then there's, unfortunately, this problem of individual differences, which gives rise to sampling error problems, but the statistics course told him how to do that, and consequently, if this is a meaningful question, it must be answerable at this time, which is frequently false. Um, which uh, means that you ought to put some of the interesting questions aside and work on some that may be somewhat less interesting, but that would contribute to the auxiliaries that you will need to uh, deal with the more interesting ones. Now, that's not, uh, not just peculiar to, to psychology. It's just that we're in worse shape than uh, some other people in other fields. Um, I give you just one example. Well, I, I'll give you two. The chemical constitution of the stars, August Comte, the founder of sociology, said we could never know. Uh, he was also the founder of positivism. And it was a sensible thing for him to say, right? Because the way you find out the chemical constitution of something is to put it with various reagents and see if you get a white precipitate and so forth. And you're not going to do that with Alpha Centauri. And so you're never going to know what it's made out of perfectly reasonable thing to say. The notion that since these things are hot and they're giving off uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and that each element has its characteristic spectral lines was something that was simply not available to August Comte and so he thought that you could never know the chemical constitution of the stars. And as, as you know, we know the chemical constitution of the sun better than we do of the earth. I mean, to more decimal points. If you take a recent breakthrough, what many, many people consider the most significant uh, breakthrough in, uh, let's say, the last half of this century, unless there's another one, uh, the Crick and Watson thing. Um, suppose, <coughs> suppose that somebody had been clever enough to concoct the idea of the DNA code in uh, 1930, let's say. Um, now, they were barking up the wrong tree, as you probably know. They, were, they had thought that it was proteins that were, uh, which contained the genetic information and not those four organic bases, uh, adenine, guadine, cytosine, and thymine. But suppose some genius had con concocted this and uh, had said, well, it's a, it's a double helix, and the, the backbone of it is the, this phosphate radical hooked to this five sugar, ribose, and you take out an oxygen in a certain place, and you got deoxy, two deoxy ribose, and then, and then uh, that's the, the skeleton, and then the crossbars, so to speak, are adenine and guanine, and, and uh, like so, and there's, this is always linked with this, whether it's E. coli or the fruit fly or us, and this is always paired up with this. Suppose some genius or somebody inspired by the Holy Ghost that, that concocted this in 1930, it wouldn't have been possible to test it because you had to know, you had to have uh, X-ray crystallography developed to the point that uh, 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 Wilkins and Franklin uh, could make these pictures, which they knew enough about by then. I look at them, I don't get much out of them, but if you're an X-ray crystallographic expert, you can see that this could only be made if you had this kind of an arrangement. And secondly, you had to have methods of determining the uh, uh, amount of these four organic bases that would enable you to say that the A was very close to the T, and the G very close to the C, close enough so that there was this kind of an arrangement. And if you didn't have sufficiently powerful stoichiometric methods in your organic chemistry, you wouldn't be able to, to do that either. And if you didn't know enough about the quantum theory of the chemical bond so that you could talk about the energies, they had a, this thing had to be hooked together 
strongly enough so it wouldn't fall apart all the time, but weakly enough so it was able to come apart when you're replicating. And that involves knowing a lot of process, a lot of things about the organic chemistry of these uh, of four things. And they didn't know that in 1930. So the point is that you had to have a measuring device uh, as regards weighing the amount of these four organic bases that go into the codons, and you had to have a measuring device for observing uh, the structure, uh, and you had to have auxiliary theories about uh, what were they spending their time on, uh, Watson and Crick and Linus Pauling too, but uh, they were sitting around with these uh, cardboard and tin things cut to look like these four things and fitting, monkeying with them, you know. That's what, that's how they did it. And, and then they would look at the uh, Wilkins and Franklin's thing and then they'd monkey around until they had, uh, they saw that you could hook these things together and get the right uh, chemical, uh, right thermodynamic properties and the right structural properties uh, and then, then you were in. Um, so, uh, that's a striking example, but there are many other examples in the life sciences and in the physical sciences, and there are examples in the physical sciences to the present time. There are questions that people ask about different galaxies or about the Big Bang that they say, well, it's too bad, we don't know how the heck to answer that at the present time. It must have an answer. Omniscient Jones knows what the answer is, and the future utopian astronomer will know what it is, but we don't know, and we don't know how to find out either because we lack the auxiliary theories we would need to embed it in, and we or we lack the observational instruments that we would need to make the measurements. All right. That is, uh, that is the end of the, uh, of the significance test <coughs> business. And since we have some time left, I'm going to shift now to a completely different topic. This doesn't do too much violence to your cell assemblies to change the subject. Um, I've had some conflict because we have only two sessions left after today, although I will be back in uh, in the latter part of the next quarter, but I have had some conflict as to what I should be uh, and what I should be uh, uh, taking up next that doesn't mesh badly with, uh, doesn't get interrupted in the middle by when I, when Dave Licken comes in here at the beginning of the uh, spring quarter. Um, I think what I will do is start today and then spill into next time talking somewhat about the problem of the concept of probability. Uh, this is... Uh, this is a uh, matter of great interest to philosophers of science as well as statisticians. Statisticians uh, don't always agonize over the question, what is the concept? Some of them have, but usually it's statisticians that have a strong philosophical bent. But philosophers of science and logicians have had to worry about the probability concept. <coughs> And uh, in the social sciences, it has a, a special importance because of the fact that so many of the relationships that we uh, study are uh, a stochastic rather than nomological in character and uh, probably are going to remain so. Uh, it would be optimistic to think that psychology is going to get fixed up so that the relationships between X and Y and Y and Z are going to be, say, like uh, the laws of the classical mechanics or something of that sort. In some domains that can happen, but in a lot of areas and in the soft areas particularly, you can assume that we will be permanently stuck with uh, probabilistic kinds of connections between some things and other things. Um, now, the, the uh, first uh, distinction that one must make in talking about uh, probability is the distinction between the epistemic usage of that word and the 
uh, object language use of it. Uh, the logician Rudolf Carnap uh, made a distinction between probability one and probability two, which is usually made by philosophers of science when they write on this subject, even if they intend uh, as they proceed to liquidate it. That is, first round, they do make this, this initial distinction. Um, probability, let me talk about probability two first because it's the one that you're familiar with. Probability two is physical or social. It refers to a relative frequency in a class and it is in the object language of the particular discipline. <clears throat> um, that's the kind of probability that we all learned about in statistics courses. For, for, for R.A. Fisher, probability was a it was a relative frequency, and uh, in most statistics book, it's, it's the only kind of probability that's discussed. If we, uh, if we talk about games of chance, we say, well, if you uh, bet on uh, a single number in, uh, at uh, Vegas, what is your probability of uh, winning? Well, there are 36 uh, numbers, but there's also zero and double zero, where the house takes your money. So there, your probability of uh, winning when you bet on, say, uh, 13, and the roulette wheel is only one in 38, and since the house pays you on the basis of uh, 35 to 1, uh, it's a losing proposition. Quite fair, since you know that, but uh, in the long run, in the long run, Unless the wheel is biased or the gods are very kind to you, you if you spend your entire life uh, playing uh, roulette, you will lose. Um, that notion of the proportion of elements in a given class that have a certain attribute is the basic idea of uh, probability two. Um, in games of chance, it is usually possible to figure out what it is by just looking at the structure of the apparatus. So that if I tell you we're playing, we're throwing dice, and you, two dice, and uh, you want to know what's the probability of uh, snake eyes, a deuce, a pair of ones, uh, there are 36 uh, uh, ways that the uh, dice can uh, fall since uh, either each die can come up any one of its six sides and if they're thrown fairly and independently uh, then uh, your probability of doing that, uh, getting that is uh, 1 in 36. Um, your probability of getting a 7 depends upon the different ways you can get a 7, a 6 and a 1, a 1 and a 6, a 4 and a 3, a 3 and a 4 and so on. In the original formulation of the theory of probability by the guys who created it, Pascal and Fermat, fellows writing in what? When were they doing this? About in the 1600s. Um, the whole theory of probability, uh, although there were earlier adumbrations of it, uh, uh, was created to answer uh, questions in games of chance. There was a certain French nobleman who uh, played a very complicated kind of, uh, of the dice game, and he figured out theoretically what the odds of winning should be, and it didn't agree with the frequency he got. He kept careful track, and so this fellow, uh, Chevalier de Marais, writes a letter to his friend Fermat, uh, who was, by the way, a lawyer by profession, um, and says, what's the matter? I don't get the right answer when I figure this out. And so Fermat writes to Pascal, and between them, they create the theory of mathematical probability. <laughs>
Uh, with games of chance, it is possible to define it the way you all learned it, uh, in high school, as a ratio of the number of favorable ways to the total number of ways. Uh, if there are five ways uh, for something to happen and there are uh, 20 ways altogether, then the probability of it happening is 5 twentieths or that uh, one fourth, point two five. Of course, in the classical theory of, as applied to games of chance, you have to use this phrase, equally likely, which subsequent critics pointed out begs the whole question if you're interested in understanding the concept of probability because equally likely already means that you have some notion of uh, probability. The fact that it begs the question conceptually, of course, doesn't prevent you from solving the problem as far as playing roulette or poker or blackjack or throwing dice is concerned. Um, because of the fact that uh, in a short run, <coughs> uh, if I flip an unbiased coin uh, ten times and I flip it fairly, I don't expect to get exactly five heads and five tails, although that's the theoretical probability in terms of equally likely ways. And because of the fact that in any specified number of flippings of the coin, uh, it can be off that value, and you can compute the probability that it will be off that value. Uh, in order to give a more rigorous definition, you then refer to the value of P, the probability, as being the limit of uh, the favorable uh, cases to all of the cases as the number increases without limit. And that definition, well, that definition goes back to the middle of the 19th century, but the two main names we connect with it uh, since the year 1900 are Richard von Mises and our friend Hans Reichenbach, whose book I have mentioned to you before. The probability when you have a series of events like flips of a penny, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, and so forth, the probability uh, is defined as the limit of the proportion of heads to the proportion of heads plus tails as the number of flippings goes on indefinitely. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'm sure you've all seen graphs of this, and when you took statistics, if somebody is crazy enough to really try it out, like uh, Weldon and what sat down and flipped a coin uh, 24,000 times, uh, is always puzzled by what he thought he was doing, because if it didn't come out right, he would conclude that he wasn't throwing it fairly, you know. Well, uh, anyway, uh, if you take a unbiased coin and you flip it in a fair manner, uh, what gets... Uh, uh, a thing that uh, uh, deviates less and less uh, from this 0.5. Uh, there's some interesting theorems about when it once gets off on one side, how long it's going to stay on that side and so forth. That's fascinating stuff. Uh, but the point is, in general, it squunges down closer and closer to the 0.5 as time goes on. And, of course, one way of looking at that is that uh, it gets harder and harder for a little tail to wag a, a great big dog. Um, the <coughs> von Mises definition uh, involved uh, two things. It involved the notion of a collective, and it had to have a certain property. And then it was it said that if the collective has that property, and then the other property it has there, that it does have this uh, limit. The property. I don't want to get into too much of the mathematics of this, but you should know this much about it. The property of a, that defines a collective for von Mises is that if in this infinitely long sequence of flippings, I state some rule for picking out a subset, any rule, provided I don't look at the result of that flip, any other rule is kosher. So you can say, well, I'll take every other flip. Or I'll take every fifth flip. Or I'll take the prime numbered flips. Or I'll take all the flips that followed two heads. That's all right. You just can't look at the particular flip you're talking about. You can look at any of the flips that preceded. 
You can say, well, I'll, I'm going to take all of the flips that followed 13 heads. Figuring that, by God, now there should be a tail, the old gambler's fallacy, as it's called. Any way of specifying a subset out of this infinite sequence of flips is called a place selection. Anyway, any formula, as complicated as you want. And the definition of a collective that von Mises offered in his famous book was a collective is a sequence such that you get the same limit of subseries defined by all possible place selections. Any rule that you write, I'll take the odd numbered ones. I'll take the ones that follow two heads and a tail. I'll take the prime numbered ones, whatever. I'll take those that correspond to the current date in the calendar. Anything, any basis of selecting the elements, so long as you don't look at the particular element you're picking, is called a place selection. And for Mises' definition of a collective is that it's a sequence such that all possible place selections will give you infinite subsequences that have exactly the same limit of the frequency of heads. Well, it turned out that that was a mathematical uh, contradiction, and uh, it had to be cleaned up. And that gets real hairy, but uh, as I understand it, some people think it was cleaned up by Wald and Copeland, and some people think it was not. This is a limit in a funny way. And normally, as you know, when we say in mathematics that uh, the limit of f of x as, say, x approaches k is L, what we mean is that the difference between L and that limit, between that limit and f of x, gets to be less than some small epsilon, however small you pick epsilon and stays that way. So to speak, you can force it as close to L as you want by taking X sufficiently close to K. That's what you learned in the beginning uh, calculus course. Well, this isn't true for the von Mises collective. That is, there is no mathematical proof that by taking the number of flows out far enough, that the percentage of heads will differ from five-tenths by as small as you please. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a proof to the contrary. The law of uh, Bernoulli's theorem tells you what's the probability that it will big be bigger than any specified amount. So it is not a limit in the sense of the mathematician. And that was one of the complaints that was made against the definition. It is what is sometimes called a stochastic limit. You make the probability that it will deviate by a certain amount from the theoretical value P as small as you want by taking it out far enough. That you can do. So it's not really a limit in the sense of the mathematician, even though the original graph that inspires that way of thinking sure as heck acts as if it were. Well, these considerations are of some interest to the mathematician. Uh, my main concern here is to s see that this definition that you all learn in beginning statistics, that the probability is a relative frequency, and if uh, you clean it up a little bit, it's the limit of a relative frequency as the series is extended indefinitely. Uh, it is an object linguistic kind of claim about the proportion of molecules or about how many people of a certain age will die in the next five years, insurance company data. That kind of probability, uh, you'll notice, cannot be defined in this Laplacian way you learned in high school about equally likely ways. I mean, the insurance actuary does not compute the different ways that somebody can die and say that they're equally likely. Uh, he just says, what's the relative frequency of persons of uh, this race and sex and age and such and such condition in the physical exam dying in the next five years? So some of the most useful kinds of probability really are not definable in terms of this Laplace notion of the ratio of equally likely uh, ways of happening to ways of happening or not happening. These things always lead to a number.
You may not know how to determine that number. If you have a very small sample of the collective, then you might not have much faith in it. But if they always, in principle, lead to a number, a relative frequency, or a limit of a relative frequency. And it wouldn't make any sense to say, I uh, think that there's a probability here, but it, there's no number that corresponds to it. So the main, the main, notion, uh, the, the, the main notion of probability that we learn in, in uh, statistics is the relative frequency concept. And it characterizes the objects of the discipline, the events, the molecules, the fruit flies, the people, the schizophrenes or whatever. There are these, these objects uh, that have an attribute or not, and then there's a definition of a collection of such objects, and then we ask what's the proportion of the objects in this, in this set that have this particular attribute. So that has a, it intrinsically has a numerical meaning. It has a numerical answer, although sometimes it may be a little hard in practice to come by it. Probability one is not an object language concept. It's a metalinguistic concept, and it refers to the relationship between a hypothesis and its evidence. It therefore is a relationship between propositions or beliefs. It does not intrinsically have the properties of a frequency. Now Reichenbach goes on and says you can fix it so it will, but we don't want to presuppose that. The reason we make this distinction following Carnap, and as I say, even people who follow Reichenbach begin by making it, you clarify the distinction that this kind of probability is a characteristic of the objects of your science, the molecules, the fruit flies, the schizophrenes, or whatever, it's a numerical value, it's in the object language, whereas this thing is in the meta language because it refers to the relationship of propositions. If the evidence for the theory of evolution is the following set of data about fossils and geographical distribution and embryology and so on, you imagine all that massive stuff, all that massive stuff in a book on evolution put down in the form of sentences. And then we say, well, what's the probability of Darwin's theory upon this body of evidence? So it's a syntactical or semantical relationship between statements. And Carnap's idea when he first started trying to work this out was that there ought to be a set of formal rules so that you could, in inductive logic, uh, grind out a p-value uh, by looking at the propositions in a particular formalized language, and you could compute a P and say the probability of the theory of evolution on the evidence that Darwin had was 0 0.71, and on the evidence that we had have today is 8 or whatever value you want to give it. That was the idea. That this doesn't look to be something numerical, but that if we had the ideal perfect language, and it worked out an algorithm for probabilifying theories on the basis of data, we would be able to compute a number just the way we do at Las Vegas. That was Carnap's uh, fantasy. Some people would say that was his delusion, which he occupied the last roughly 20 years of his life working out. Well, I'll say some more about that next time. Uh, it's about time to quit. But the main point about this one is to see that it's in, in the meta language rather than the object language, and it's about propositions rather than about people or fruit flies or stones or molecules. Okay.